Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. From DEF CON 29 in Las Vegas, Douglas Tuman interviews Guillermo Christensen, a partner at Ice Miller's Data Security and Privacy and White Collar Defense Groups. The two discuss his DEF CON talk about the state of cryptocurrency ransomware. Monero Talk starts now. Right, Guillermo. Guillermo, am I saying it right? You got it right. Yes, okay. that's the Argentine pronunciation of Guillermo. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, born, born over there. Argentina. Yeah, yeah. Immigrated to the U.S. Yep. Yep. Really? Okay. So, yeah. Why don't you quickly introduce yourself? That's probably that's probably the best way to start. Yeah. This. Well, and that's important because, you know, I come from a country where finance is a disaster. Right. Most of my relatives have had most of their money at one point or another seized by the government, held up by the government, devalued by the government. You name it, in Argentina, they've tried some way to basically undermine stability in, in, in currency and destroy the, the confidence that people have in what they own. So it's one of the reasons why I tend to be more enthusiastic about the topic today of cryptocurrency and Monero and probably many other people. I've seen what real, you know, what, what so-called real money, how it can be abused by. Right. You know why crypto is, is needed, what the, the, the actual use cases that it can fulfill, because you've experienced it firsthand when fiat yeah. goes bad. Exactly. I think whether it will come out to be the solution or not, I have no idea. But I am a believer that innovation needs a lot of space. And, and so I, that's why I'm, I'm in favor of, well, when we talk about things that are, people are talking about with cryptocurrency these days, we can talk about that. But in terms of my background, so I'm a, the partner, the managing partner of the Washington, D.C. office of a law firm called Ice Miller. We're mostly in the U.S., in the Midwest, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia, and D.C. And I run a team of uh, cybersecurity lawyers. Uh, that does incident response. So we do a lot of ransomware. And yesterday, as you know, I gave a talk here about what ransomware looks like. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we also try very hard to keep people from getting into trouble. I, my, I prefer that my clients called me before they had a problem than afterwards. So we call that, in, in my world, we call that left of boom or right of boom, boom being the incident. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a military thing. Um, Unfortunately, most people wait until, it's human nature, right? Wait until the, the, the shit hits the fan. So um, I hope you don't mind. You're, you can bleep that out if you want. <laughs> but anyway, so. No um, censorship here. This is, this is Monero. All right, this is Monero. That's right. So, so that's, that's what I do now. I come from a background. My, my father was a computer scientist very early on in Argentina. So I was playing with computers as a little kid. I was breaking them, more importantly, which is why this, this environment of DEF CON makes, is, is so comfortable for me. And then I went into the government. I was an intelligence officer for almost 15 years. I then went back into the government later on and did policy stuff at something called the OECD in Paris, where they do a lot of work right now on cryptocurrency, uh, but also on cybersecurity and encryption and all that. So um, a lot of places that I've kind of been in that all, at the end of the day, come back to the topic that we're we're here to do. And as an intelligence officer, you you were doing cybersecurity related things. I was doing a lot of things, and I can't really talk about the specifics, you know. But I was in the US and 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 overseas. Um, but a lot of what I draw on is is the training, the the concept of how to protect sources and methods and information, which is almost completely transferable to protecting systems, people, for businesses, 
or not businesses. I work with universities, I work with even high schools, not for profits to protect them. Because the, the idea here, especially with, with cyber crime, it doesn't really matter where they go to get money as long as you have money. So if you're a, if you're a very wealthy not-for-profit, even though you're not making profit, you have money in the bank, you're vulnerable and you will get attacked. So it's, there's, and, and cryptocurrency uh, people in, in, in this sector are getting hammered all the time because there's nothing easier than stealing money digital money right i mean there's a bearer asset and in monero's case that's untra untraceable once you obtain once you it. lose it it's gone right i mean it's so i so I, I do a fair amount of work with people who are very interested in this area but want to make sure that they don't end up losing everything because you know they make a small mistake and it's very easy in this in this area to make a small mistake to somehow lose control of your wallet uh, or have it intercepted you know so yeah anyway. so you help companies out with with handling their their crypto as well, beyond so beyond the ransomware stuff because we we got to get into that. Absolutely, but. yeah. So building and it's no different than building a competent security system for any other business. What you need to identify is what is it you're trying to protect, who you're trying to protect it from, what are you doing right now, and what are the gaps to what you could be doing to make it better. So for a lot of a lot of people who hold crypto. It's a question, do you want to have a cold wallet? Do you want to have, you want to have it live? If you're going to have it live, what, what are your protections? How are you protecting, because in all likelihood, right, this is, this is what you're using for that. How are you protecting this? Do you have a good, solid understanding for your hardware and then your workflow, right? If, if you're in a business where you're moving a lot of crypto, do you have certain controls so that someone can't get what we call a man in the middle attack. Sure, there should be a person in the middle attack because, you know, we should not, you know, but basically someone who gets in between you and the person you trust and somehow manages to make you think you're actually talking to Joe when you're actually talking to Igor in, in, in Yekaterinburg in Russia. And Igor says, send me the money and you send him the money. And then later on, you find out, yeah, it went to the wrong person and it's gone. Very similar to what we do with businesses that get ripped off by cybercrime using traditional bank accounts. The difference is these days we have something called a financial kill chain, which is when we work with the Secret Service and with the FBI, and we can often get money clawed back from the, through the banking system within about 48 to 72 hours. So in other words, let's say you, you know, you're, you're running your business, somebody you mistakenly wire $100,000 to the wrong people, right? And it's very easy to do. The, the bad guys get into your system, they change banking information, or they send you an email from your best customer saying, I got, you know, I changed my banking information, send my payment here, or whatever it is, right? You send it, and then they call you the next day and go, oh, we didn't get the money, right? That's the oh shit moment, right? Everybody panics. Well, if you get on that right away, and like I say, 48 hours, 72 hours is about the max, it's possible to basically call that back because the banks are still holding that money right mm -hmm. or they can and, and it's hard to transfer that money out this is one of the advantages of traditional banking versus crypto for that window of, of, of time right I will tell you how often that happens very small mm -hmm. right um, because businesses don't realize that they've been ripped off until a week or two has gone off and sometimes people don't want to admit they're trying desperately to figure out a way to do it themselves and they can't so so that same model doesn't work with crypto Right, uh, unless there's some escrowing of it, and you know that's not easy. So, so but but the same kind of concepts around before you authorize any transaction, what checks do you need to do, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we we talk a lot about what's called out of band communications. So, if you normally you might ask me to make the transfer by email, for me to prove that you are you, right? I need to go out of band. I need to use some other way to communicate with you that will verify that it's in fact you and not someone who has control of your email mm -hmm. or your text messages. Mm -hmm. So so let's get into the ransomware. Um, so, so you're the guy or you work for the firm uh, that's called when a ransomware attack happens. You're, you're, you're the, one of the go-to uh, firms for that purpose. Well, first, I would say there are a lot of people in this area right now because it's an epidemic of enormous proportions. So there are a lot of law firms, there are a lot of incident responders out there. But certainly when it happens, 
to one of my existing clients, and by that I mean a client of the firm, mm -hmm. or someone who knows me and they don't have someone who knows anything about it, they will call me and they'll say, hey, we've got this problem, what should we do, right? And it's usually, I mean, it's a very unpleasant phone call for everybody concerned. I mean, I've done enough of them and I'm used to them, but you know, they're, they're usually in, sitting there in a situation where their entire business often has ground to a halt. It's as if it was just ripped out of their heart, right? And especially when you talk about small, medium-sized businesses, it is their heart. I mean, people put a lot of their life into it, and all of a sudden, someone out of nowhere comes in and destroys the heart of the system, the, 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 the network or whatever it is that's been hit by the ransomware, and now they're, they don't know what to do. And you can't really call the police. I mean, if you call, you call your local police and say, file a report, if you call the FBI, you know, bless them, but they don't have enough people to do anything right now. I mean, they're just overwhelmed, even with the big attacks, right? Small attacks, I'll say, file a report, we'll see what we can do. So it's really self-help. Mm -hmm. And what is the process? So if you can take us to, I know, I recommend, so anybody that sees this, you should certainly watch your talk from yesterday. I think that's, that will be posted at some point. But if you can, kind of give a quick yeah. synopsis of what the process is. and right. So the first thing is, uh, you know, w we need to get someone into the network to understand what's happened. And usually you will find the indicator of who's involved with the ransomware. It's some kind of a text file or, or PDF or something that they've left unencrypted, right, that tells you who's behind it, at least tells you who to contact, right? But if you're running, if it's your, your network, what's basically happened is you're gonna find you can't access any files. Many of your systems won't operate because when they encrypt system files as opposed to data files, the system doesn't work, right? And, and, and ransomware is a little bit like, um, it's like deleting files. So on a system these days, when someone deletes a file, you don't really delete it. Like for an iPhone, for example, I don't really delete the file. What I delete in many cases is the, the encryption key that protects the information. With ransomware, they're kind of turning that on its head and they're using that to basically delete the file from your access while they could still access it using their decryptor. So you've lost access to your system. In some cases, you have no phone service. If you use voice over IP, you have no email, you have no bank accounts, you have got no customer account, nothing, right? So the first thing is you got to get somebody in there to figure out what kind of a ransomware it is. That's the incident response team. We, we usually hire them because there may be a lot of litigation that comes out of this problem. It could be, for example, that the company loses data in the process of the ransomware and there may be contractual problems. So doing with lawyers, and this is why I get involved, not just because what I, I know how this works, because I can help them provide legal counsel and that's privilege, which in the US context is very important. So I bring in incident response people, people who are good at forensics, and they get into the system and they try to figure out just how bad this was. We try to get good information, although most of it in the first 72 hours is not good. It's, there's a lot of confusion. But we try to figure out is how bad was the attack and can we recover without paying the ransom? And by that I mean without getting the decryptor that we get from the bad guys. Because the way this works is, you pay a ransom so you will get a piece of software that has a key, decryption key embedded in there that allows you to unencrypt your system, right? Mm -hmm. So almost invariably, we will engage in some negotiation with the threat actor, right? That's the, 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 the cyber crime. And, and it usually happens over, Proton Mail is still the most popular. There's some that use different, but you're basically talking to someone, you have no idea who they are, although most of the time you can figure out they're probably Eastern European, Russian, by the way that they, they talk. If you know something, if you've seen the same ransomware deployed in many other contexts, you may actually know which group it is, mm -hmm. because we, we label the ransomware by a certain type of software that's being used. Mm -hmm. More recently, I'd say in the last two years, we've had something akin to cloud services, so ransomware as a service, where the group, 
uh, basically dark side, the guys who hit the Colonial Pipeline, they essentially create an infrastructure mm -hmm. for ransomware, and then you, the criminal, goes and basically hires them or, or pays them in order to use that infrastructure. Well, not me. I mean, I... No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get your point. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, any, any, any hacker can jump on there yeah. and they could uh, start using and they, this and they, and it's very ransomware as a service. Very yeah. easy to, to get into that business. Uh, there are a lot of uh, tutorials. It's remarkably how it's remarkable how professional they become. I, I kid, and I'm only halfway kidding, that if you have a problem with a with an encryption um, ransomware program, you probably will get better customer support from them than you would if you call one of the big tech companies. And then, if we could just talk about that real quickly, because dark in with the dark side, they ended up essentially tracking these guys down and somehow obtaining one of the Bitcoin wallets that was... It's actually much simpler than that. Okay. Um, from what the FBI has has kind of talked about, off the record, I think, in newspapers, but I think it's also in some of the legal documents, they actually seem to actually have had a copy of the wallet. They, they knew the wallet, not a copy of the wallet. That's the wrong way to talk about it. They had, they had somewhere, they had intercepted and gotten a hold of probably someone... One of these guys, their cell phone or their device, where they had the wallet. So they had the private key. They had the private key, exactly. And so it wasn't like they they hacked. Uh, you know, they figured out how to extract a Bitcoin private no, key magically. No, no, no. I mean, you know, I mean, some people have said, well, is it, could that be a cover story for you know deployment of a quantum decryptor against these things? I don't think so. I, I don't think anybody would blow that technology on a two and a half million dollar recovery, right? Because the bad guys would know. They 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 figured it out. So my my guess is. One of them got popped somewhere, probably you know, in, in some raid or something, and the and the bureau or you know somebody had been sitting on that private key and watching that, and it just they had you know good luck. It happened to be the one that those guys were using for this. The great story, and 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 you know frankly, in 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 that world, they might have not figured it out for months later that they had it and then they would have obviously lost the opportunity. So kudos to them for doing it and getting it done right. The thing is, it's not going to happen again in all likelihood because the bad guys realized they should not have been sitting on that wallet that long, right? Because usually what they do is when the money, when, when, the, when, the, when the ransom hits the first stage, they immediately begin tumbling it, moving it, getting it out of those wallets as quickly as possible. Because um, obviously they're they're vulnerable on the exchanges side, right? So so they usually clear out from that and disperse it. And also it's a it's a kind of a complicated business because usually that ransom is used not just to pay the the criminal, uh, it's used to pay a bunch of other people associated with the crime. Mm -hmm. So there is something called access brokers. These are the people who give you the the key information to break into that system. They hoard data. They're a little bit like an Equifax for criminals, right? They they accumulate data, and then and then sell it, right? Like data brokers do in the legitimate industry, right? And I say that with air quotes because it's not always that legitimate. But anyway, so you have the data brokers. You have the people who actually break into the system. Then you might have the negotiators. So just like on the response side, we have people who have spent time negotiating they have now more and more professionalized negotiators who speak English better than others, who know the tactics, and who plan how to get the most money out of the victim, right? Because a lot of that goes, goes hand in hand with knowing the pain points for the victim. You know, are how they, much money they have. How much money they have, how much are they willing to pay for that data to get it back, and sometimes how much are they willing to pay to make sure that the data that was taken out of the system, because that's something else they're doing now a lot, doesn't show up somewhere to embarrass or humiliate or cause further economic loss if it's intellectual property, for example. That's the so-called double extortion thing where they not only encrypt your system, but before they do that, they spend a few days or weeks pulling data out, right, stealing the information, which is what they used to do in the old days, and then selling that. Now they can encrypt hold you for ransom and steal the data, potentially sell it, but also use that to exert more pressure on you to pay. So, very smart people. I mean, you, you know, it's, this is a, 
a lot of talent being misallocated here, I'll say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, and with the rise of cryptocurrency in terms of price, some of these guys, are, you know, they're, they're becoming uh, quite powerful in terms of the amount of assets they hold. So the some of these uh, organized crime groups, we estimate, are, you know, making three to four hundred million dollars a year. That's that's a lot of money yeah. for uh, yeah, there's obviously a lot of effort that goes into it, but more importantly, it's not doesn't really require much infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? So my law firm, you know, I have to have buildings, I've got to pay staff, I've got to have IT, you know, if if, if I had a net revenue of 300, you know, if I had if I had revenues of 300 million dollars a year, I'm not walking away with 300 million a year. I got to pay unemployment and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have to pay any of that. The only thing they probably have to pay they may have to pay for some uh, what we call bulletproof infrastructure, so places to be able to host what they're doing. And then they're probably paying a lot of bribes locally, wherever they are, for the, the, the law enforcement there to basically not mess with them. Yeah. So the question on everybody's mind here, this is Monero talk. Uh, why didn't Darkseid ask for their ransom in Monero? Or I believe they actually did with the, with the discount, but why didn't they insist on Monero? And if they would have used Monero, would they uh, have potentially have gotten away with the crime? Well, I would say they got away with a crime because they got 50% of the ransom we haven't, was not recaptured, right? So they got away with a crime. The, the issue with Monero is you imagine trying to raise within two or three hours five million in Monero, right? So it's a liquidity issue. It's a liquidity issue. That's a big, that's a big one. If they can work in Monero, they would absolutely work in Monero. They have figured out long before any policymakers, anybody in the treasury, that Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies like those uh, are inherently traceable when you're using good tools and, you're, and you've got enough data coming into your system, right? It's not, it's anonymized, but really on a pseudo level, it does not really, it, it's not, I mean, in some ways, I think for law enforcement, a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is actually better in some ways to trace than just cash. I mean, cash, you got to have, a, you know, obviously every bill has a serial number, but it's not easy to trace, right? Crypto, like Bitcoin, is much easier. Perfectly traceable in many ways. And, 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 the, and the blockchain makes sure that you've got that evidence. It's, it's there, it's immutable, right? If it's, if it's something like Bitcoin, right? Monero is different. So I think that the, 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 the concern right now in the government and in law enforcement is if for some reason the liquidity and the accessibility issues around crypto like Monero is easier for the for the criminals, they will definitely shift to that. Are Mom. you starting to see that shift already? And they're sorry trying. to interrupt. No, 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 they're, I, they're trying to shift. But again, they understand. I mean, we, we will tell them, look, there's no way we can raise anything like this in Monero. So if you want to, if you want to get Monero, you're going to have to accept a much, much lower payment. And right now they can handle the risks of being paid in Bitcoin quite adequately if they use the existing tools that they're using to obfuscate the trail of the money over time. And considering that where they end up is a place where we can't touch them. And by we, I mean, you know, the whole world that's trying to prevent this. So as law enforcement gets better at going after the Bitcoin or, or tracing the payment channels through Bitcoin and, and doing something about it and interdicting it, there will be more imagination, I think, on the bad guy side to figuring out a way to deal with this through Monero. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm concerned about this is this. A lot of ransom right now is being paid ultimately by insurance companies. The big ones, you know, whether it's Colonial Pipeline or some of JBS, the meat producer, right? I'm certain that they had very good insurance, cyber insurance policy, which, by the way, the cyber insurance companies are losing their shirts on right now. Um, so it, it has, to some extent, added fuel to this fire. That's changing because the, company, the, the insurance companies are losing a lot of money. So what are they doing? Obviously, they are pricing it much higher also excluding some people from being able to access the market because they're not you know they know that the, they're going to be victims and they're going to be paying out 
they're changing deductibles and all that. So I think what's going to happen is that, that will have a, a, a downward pressure on ransomware prices because companies, most companies can't afford to pay $5 million in Bitcoin or anything, right, to get their system back. They can afford it because they have the cyber insurance. When you take the cyber insurance out, their ability to pay is going to be maybe 500,000, 250,000. So that will mean the what you need to pay in a ransom is going to be lower, so that makes it easier potentially to switch to Monero or something else. The other the other thing that I think is going to happen is that the cyber attackers are going to expand the number of attacks they're mounting. They're getting much better at scaling these. So in the old in the old days and by that I mean 5 years ago, these were really what I would call bespoke, you know, the way the British say customized, right? They were really bespoke attacks. You had to have people who would figure out the network, get in there, do their stuff and all that. Now they're using tools, they have access to better understanding of how networks are vulnerable so they can hit a much larger group of companies at the same time. And with the ransomware as a service, they have people working for them. Exactly, exactly. So they've professionalized it to the point where I think they could bring the amounts down but increase their, obviously, the, the number of attacks. So their revenue numbers probably won't change. They might even go up. That will be an interesting, uh, an interesting change because it will. I think it will actually decrease pressure on people to do something about ransomware, because the reason people are all worked up about ransomware is because of Colonial Pipeline, JBS, right? I mean, th we've been doing this for ten years now, and that we've been, and, and people like me have been saying this is a really serious problem. This is, you know, we're we're f we're feeding a monster here as we pay more ransom, and they're getting better at it, and you know, so we got to do something about it. I suspect. You know, if, if Colonial Pipeline hadn't happened, this would not be an issue at the national level. We'd still be doing it below the surface. So what it tells me is if I'm on the bad guy side and, and we're seeing this, the, the dark side, the new dark side, the black, it's called Black Matter, and everybody's pretty sure the same group, very clear that they're trying to stay away from doing another one of those. Mm -hmm. They got a good amount of money, but they got a lot of heat. Right. So they're going to stay clear of that. They may be more intelligent about who their targets are. Mm -hmm. And if they do that, I imagine with our attention span in, in this country and with national security being about, you know, two months, something else will come up, people will shift to it, and all of this talk in the administration and in the government about, you know, this is such an important problem, it's going to go, so. Very interesting. So you're saying because of market dynamics, essentially, in that ecosystem, that the, the, the payments that they're going to be requesting is probably going to go down in value. They're going to hit lower level tar targets, but hit more of them and potentially effectively start asking for Monero, which is what they want to ask for. But if the, if the ask amount is lower, they might be able to get away with doing that as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It'll change the dynamics. Now, um, you know, there's, there are still, they still have issues uh, converting, right? They can't, they don't want to exist always in, the, in, in a crypto environment. Right? They, they need to convert their money at some point into something else. We still, you know, the, the, the marketplace for crypto is still not complete enough for them to be able to do everything solely on crypto, right? So that will still be an issue for them. And, and that's where there's potential for law enforcement to do something about it because when you convert to something else or fiat, you're on the exchanges. Obviously, you can, you can operate on the exchanges that aren't doing any KYC, but that also is an area where I suspect we're going to see a lot more action not just because of ransomware, but because uh, ministries of finance, treasury departments are very focused on those, those uh, dark pools right, are, are great sources. They view great sources of risk to the entire financial system. So they want to they clean that up. It's, a, it's, a, it's also interesting and, and, and mysterious. I mean, is there any... Uh, anyone that thinks that there might be some connection between some of these insurance companies and the actual ransomware, get, you the know, the, the dark ransomware criminals? No. It seems like a win-win business at that point. It, 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 it would be, I suppose. No, uh, first, not as many insurance companies provide cyber insurance. You know, it's not like car insurance or fire insurance or whatever. It's still a pretty specialized area. And so you're talking about the very large companies. Um, 
and they don't make, I mean, it, it still as a marketplace for insurance, it's still a very, very small percentage. I mean, compared to, you know, fire policies, commercial policies, all that, it's still a very small place. I can't, I mean, I'm sure it's, you know, it's, you could conceive of such a scenario, but given the returns, it makes no sense that anybody would fool with that kind of, I mean, that would be colossally stupid, so. Do you anticipate there'll be some uh, action take or additional actions taken by governments to thwart uh, the use of things like Monero because they're they're concerned of the fact that it's so anonymous and private? So maybe uh, doing things to 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 keep it uh, illiquid, you know, so uh, making it difficult for people to on ramp and off ramp with Monero, or do you suspect? governments are thinking along those lines? I do, I think, and I think the area where that's most likely to happen is through the exchanges, right? They want, if, if they can, I mean, if you think about it, if they can mostly lock down the exchanges to ones that are doing KYC that have the records, right? Because really that's the, the, the key thing for the government is how can I trace who, who was on either side of that transaction? That's really key. And in the financial system today, that's really easy. I mean, you cannot, you cannot do anything on the financial system without a digital trace, right? So those exchanges, if you were to be able to uh, really, you know, make them transparent as opposed to the opaqueness right now and force them to do the KYC, force them to collect the information about the counterparties and hold it and provide it to the government, that would potentially go a long way to keeping the ability of a of an of someone to go from say a monero to something else a monero to fiat right and that so th i think that's where they're putting a lot of effort do you think it would ever make sense for companies to start purchasing crypto or in monero things like monero in particular uh in, in anticipation of potentially being uh, a victim of a ransomware hack. So maybe instead of buying insurance, they buy Monero? I, I, I recommend against it for, for two reasons. One, if, if they have that money, I would spend it on protecting yourself first rather than becoming a, rather than planning to become a victim and, you know, sort of like I'm going to get two wallets. I'm going to put, you know, $500 in both of them, one for my use and the other one for the thief that, that is going to uh, hold me up. Why not just not go into the dark alley and don't get, you know, held up, right? So, um, and then the other thing is... But they're still buying the insurance, right? So, like, insurance is just, it's, that's just a loss there, right? They're, they're paying for that insurance. Yeah. With, with If they bought Monero, it essentially is, is providing insurance, but it's also an asset that's potentially appreciating a value. So the idea, obviously, with insurance is you're not buying, you're buying coverage that's ex in excess of what your loss might be. So you might pay, and I've had clients that have had, you know, policies that they paid, cyber policies that were maybe two, $3,000 premiums with a million dollars worth of coverage. So that's a no-brainer, right? Now that's going to change. So it's, uh, one, one scenario that might, might be applicable is if you can't get insurance, and then you say, but we're at very heavy risk, let's park some money in Monero and have it available if we ever have to spin up the machine and make that payment. There's, I think there's some, you know, there's maybe some out there who might think that way. My, my concern though is protecting, protecting your, your wallet is not an insignificant risk, especially for a business, right? It's not, and, and who controls it? So you have to have a lot of other thoughts in there. And then the other thing is you'd be maintaining, in all, in, in, you probably end up maintaining a, a fairly significant balance, right? That's not, you know, you can't use it for anything else yet. So I'd say for most people, probably not a good idea. Probably better to, to if, you, if you think that it's a serious problem, and you should because it definitely is, focus on staying out of trouble rather than, you know, you now staying out of trouble and focusing on that does mean spending some effort to know what to do when you do get into trouble, right? But, uh, but I think at this point, I would rather spend the money on, 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 the, on the, the left of boom part, so.
Do you see a scenario where governments essentially make it illegal to, to pay a ransom? Oh, there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of efforts out there right now, mostly at the state level in the U.S. There's some uh, in some other countries. And there, is a, there was a federal, there was a bill kind of making its way through Congress where they were talking about making it much harder to pay ransoms, certainly to have to be, to report them to the government when you pay them. But there are calls. There are definitely a number of calls to prohibit people from paying ransom. Uh, I think it's a very questionable premise because what you're basically saying is, and, and, and this has been something we've talked about in, in you know, decades ago when we were talking about ransoms for physical kidnappings, right? How can you, you know, a family wants to pay to get the father back. How can you say no, just let him die, right? Kind of the same thing you're talking about here. So I think that most people, most sensible people understand if you ban the ransomware payments, first, you're going to have a lot of co companies taking it in the chin in a big way. Second, you're going to have a lot of people making the payments and not reporting or sharing any information with law enforcement, which is bad. So for those two reasons, I think right now, there's a, there's a good, strong pushback on the idea of, of ransomware being outlawed. Right, because a, a company is going to say, hey, you know, I'll pay this Monero ransom. I'm just not going to tell anybody. Right. And right. I'll tell you, that could change in the blink of an eye if you had, you know, if, if something like Colonial Pipeline happened again, you know, two months before an election or, or somewhere where the, the politicians get spun up and go and do what they usually do, which is come up with a, a solution that looks great but isn't, that's where I think we, we could have a problem. And that's where I think a, a, a bill, you know, some kind of a legislative proposal that says you can't pay it or... Even without more new laws, the Department of Treasury can very easily take what they've already issued, which was basically an advisory that said, you know, if you're going to make payments to these crypto criminals, you better make sure you're not making payments to people who are banned through Treasury's OFAC. Yeah, that's the question I yeah. want to ask as well. Yeah, so OFAC... Which is another reason why people may not want to use Monero, right? You kind of made that point yesterday. There's, there are some, there are some, yeah, there's some connections. So OFAC basically is this, it, it dates back to World War II, the Office of Foreign Assets Control. And it's a very powerful and not well-known part of the U.S. government that essentially working with the, with FinCEN, which is the, the Treasury's in intelligence, um, financial intelligence unit, they are able to... Uh, prohibit any U.S. person from having anything to do with the property of a person or a company or a country that's been blocked. All right. So, for example, um, narco traffickers. There's a, a something called the kingpin sanctions. As soon as they figure out that there's a new group in Mexico, they put them on there, and you can't do any business with them. Right. Same thing with Russians and others. So, there's. Uh, the, the, the problem here is some of the ransomware is coming out of Iran. Some of it's coming out of North Korea. When we have some suspicion that's the case, no one involved in the entire incident response is going to touch that. The, 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 the insurance company is not going to pay. The banks will not facilitate. The lawyers won't be involved because that is a pretty much, I mean, if, if you do that, it's strict liability. There's no intent. And if you know what you're doing is wrong and you do it, you've potentially got criminal penalties, you know, where you go to jail. So, so it's pretty serious stuff. So OFAC could conceivably start putting every ransomware group out there on the list very quickly, and that would effectively kill the payments. Yeah, we, we've already seen, you know, Bitcoin wallets that have been black, you know, essentially put yeah. on OFAC lists. Yeah, yeah, which... You know, is um, how how limited can that possibly? I mean, that that's about the the most feckless thing you can do, right? Because how hard is it to get another one, right? Those wallets are so so. It's it's um, and 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 it's. I'm not poking fun at them, but it is still something they're trying to understand how this ecosystem works. And you know, when you go hear some of the you know the ransomware panels like the one they had here uh, earlier. You, you, you notice that the policymakers just are not, they're not in the weeds, right? They don't understand how the mud it feels in their fingers when they're doing this stuff. 
and you have to. That's why I say I, I, I don't, I don't. I mean, I listen to a lot of people who know a lot about this stuff, but one of my key discriminators is, do they actually do this every day, or are they involved in it? Because if they don't, they're just talking about something they read in the newspaper. They don't know what they're talking about, and so that's when we talk about you know putting these wallets on the OFAC SDN list. It really doesn't do very much. It just makes companies go through an additional KYC check for what? So, so where do you, where do you see this all heading? Uh, obviously, you have a, a really good understanding of the ransomware environment. You understand crypto very well. You understand the positive use cases for crypto very well. Uh, I think you understand that things like Monero are essentially unstoppable in many ways. So how do you see all those things working together? You know, you have governments that are concerned about ransomware. You have these hackers that are continuing to figure out ways to kind of scale up their operations. And then you have something like the Monero protocol that's essentially here to stay. So what, what's the equilibrium that, that we eventually reach here? I don't think we're going to reach an equilibrium for a long time. I'll just tell you that. I think we're, this is a very, so, my, my expectation is the next three to five years are going to see cybercrime going much, much worse than what we're seeing right now. I think it's as more of these groups have success, they're pulling in more people and they're pulling in more talent. And there's a lot of talent. In a place like Russia, for example, you have a lot of people who are not well employed, who are not making a lot of money, but have excellent mathematical background. They have excellent engineering background. They turn to the dark side, so to speak, and they're fantastic at what they do. And you know, so, so part of the problem is that that ecosystem of where the crime is coming is very fertile and going to grow. So I, I think it's, I don't know whether the, you know, the trend towards um, more privacy is going to start pushing back on some of this. And it's not just in the cryptocurrency world. You know, we've, we've been having a, a debate about end-to-end -end encryption. You know, the FBI has very, been very focused on we can't allow to have, we can't allow these companies to have end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platforms that we can't see when something goes wrong. On the flip side, and this is more my viewpoint, end-to-end -end encryption and secure communications is one way in which we can largely push back on the criminals because if it's encrypted already and it's encrypted well, they can't do anything with it. You know, so uh, 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 what I tell clients is, you know, if you have your data well encrypted, they could take the whole server. Hell, they could physically take it. There's very little they can do with it if it's done right, right? So encryption is, is, a, is a big part of this and privacy and encryption go hand to hand. So there's, there's, there's a lot of pieces there that are moving very quickly. I think we're very early in the stages of the discussion about this. And so I wouldn't necessarily predict that any one thing is going to triumph over another. And I would say that cryptocurrency still faces a, a huge amount of risks. Separate from the technical arguments, I think the regulatory environment could turn negative very quickly on some of these kinds of problems. But do you think that could, could essentially effectively stop crypto, stop something like Monero, or that that's just going to be... Uh, you know, something that temporarily maybe yeah. s makes it more difficult to, to get access to. So I think it would, if, if you, if it's, you know, if you had a balloon kind of model for this, I think it would squeeze the center. So it would push blockchain and cryptocurrency type platforms to commercial banking, large scale, right? Where it has many adopters for good reasons. And it would push it into smaller applications, but it would leave the, the center where the wide ad adoption would be at the consumer level, at the small, medium-sized business, I think it could it could result in that being squeezed out. Because the, the, the advantage of, of something like cryptocurrency is that the transaction cost, the reliability, the trust are built into it. But if government is telling you, don't touch this, and you can't convert it from crypto to fiat or vice versa, or if you do, you've got to go through this very onerous process, and you have to report it, that's, that, will, that will definitely slow things down. It's not unlike the, the way that, you know, I mean, the whole, the internet is what it is today because the government basically said, we're gonna 
leave a certain degree of freedom for companies to experiment without liability. It's not, I mean, that's a very simplified version of Section 230, but essentially that was an experiment. Let's see what happens. And boy, it worked great. Do you think it's going to essentially come down to constitutional arguments of, you know, free speech, you know, uh, codis speech, you know, uh, allowing the existence of encryption, of encryption to be, you know, encryption to be used, money is speech. I mean, these ideas that uh, legally the United States government shouldn't be allowed to stop people from using an open source protocol that's used for transacting value. Yeah. I think if you look at the, the constitutional arguments versus the practical arguments of how the finance system is regulated, the authorities are much stronger on the finance regulation side. It's, I think those arguments, uh, I think that they will prevail on many of them. Um, it's well, just, that's sad to hear. I'll be, I'll be fighting on the other side for oh, sure. Of course, and there should be people. There definitely, and there should be more people. But I think the reality is that the, 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 um, our, our finance system, our banking system is a very, very heavily regulated. And I think it, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of built-in interest to protect that for good reasons and bad. That's, there's a lot on that side. And on, on, on the other side, it's still a very small constituency. So, All right. Well, have to grow it faster. <laughs> we're gonna have to you have to grow that constituency a lot faster, I think. We're, we're working on it. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the gratuitous espresso. Fantastic. No, very good. Thank you. And I love the idea that, that you're helping people to figure out a way around getting their money seized by their government, wherever it may be. So that's yeah, did you get the cut? So basically, uh, if, if you like the coffee, yeah. you can send a tip with Monero and it goes directly, directly to, to 20 of the farmers. Yeah, no, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, cool. so it's a, good, cool. it's a good cause. Thank you so much. Right. Appreciate it. Pleasure, huh? Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.